Hi everyone, it's Rachel from Don't Crop Me Now. For a while on our YouTube channel, there's been quite a few requests for asking for videos about how we can using the log lids, which a lot of you have seen in our storage videos. So I thought I would give you a quick demonstration and today I am going to make a base sauce for curry. Now this is far from a traditional curry recipe, but it gives you a nice base where you can add additional products and spices to produce a range of different curries. It's actually very similar in style to the way British um, Indian restaurants cook, where they make a base curry and they add additional things in to make different types of curry. So this is my version of this, which uh, is suitable for canning. So to start off with this recipe, you need a base of different vegetables. Ideally, there should be a large proportion of onions in this. In here, there's a lot of carrots that are on the top, but as you can see here, there's a large amount of onions. So I use two of our sort of giant onions for this, about three sort of large yellow courgettes. There's probably about four or five large carrots, and there's a tiny bit of celery, just because we had it left in the fridge. So this is a seven litre food box to give you an idea of the volume. I think as long as you're putting a lot of onions in there, potentially you could put any other vegetable that you wanted in there. Personally, I wouldn't put uh, brassicas in there because I think when you can them, certainly for a long period like we're going to do now, it doesn't give the best flavour, but you could certainly use other root vegetables. For I've made this with just onions and courgettes and I found that works quite well as well. So I'm just using these because I've got a lot of these left over. Other things I'm putting in is a lot of ginger and garlic. So on the left, that's some pickled garlic from our garlic from last year. And on the right, that is fresh ginger. I have not chopped this particularly small because it's going to simmer for absolute ages. And then I am going to blitz this down anyway. We need a load of different spices. So this is quite a lot of spices, but this was going to make a huge amount of the 500 ml cans. So this is a mixture, some salt in there, ground coriander, ground cumin. There is uh, madras curry powder, uh, turmeric. That's the main actually, I think that's what I put in. Uh, I will do a list uh, in the comments as well to help. So I have measured these in equal quantities. It's about a tablespoon of each, and about half a teaspoon of the salt and double the amount of cumin, so there was two tablespoons of cumin. So this does look like a lot of spices, but obviously this is going to make a very large volume. I'm also going to add in some um, methi, which is fenugreek um, leaves. This is some I dried myself. I, I didn't grow this. I actually got it from, there's a local shop that sells a lot of Indian products, and I got it from there. So I'm going to add in maybe... A good dessert spoon of that as well so that's the spices i'm not going to fry these off mainly because we're going to slow cook this down for long periods and then we're going to can it for a long period oils or most oils are really not very stable um, in high pressure canning they certainly can use certain types some oils and particularly coconut oil works quite well but for this, I don't need to add in a lot of oil because when you make the, um, add the other ingredients in at cooking to make your curry, it's like you put some oil in there with your other flavourings. So I don't put any oil in at all. So we will now just add in all the vegetables. So this is a preserving pan, standard size preserving pan. And as you can see, that is just about filled to the top. So now I'm going to top this with as much water as I can physically fit in the pan so it doesn't boil over on the stove. So there we go. It's got as much water as I'm probably going to physically get in that pan. And now I'm just going to simmer it for a good couple of hours. I probably will need to add more water in when I do start to blend this because you shouldn't can sort of very thick substances. But I will start off with this because it can cook down within this and we can add additional water as required. So it's been simmering for probably about an hour or so, I think, enough that the veg is sort of tender. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to blend it up a bit and just see how thick it turns out. So now let's get on to the actual canning bit. 
So what I'm talking about here is a pressure canning process and we'll use this pressure canner, which is a Presto pressure canner. I imported this from America. I have to say it was pretty costly because I actually imported it right at the beginning of lockdown. But it's a really worthy investment if you want to get into storing as much as your pro of your produce, produce you, that you can, that you grow yourself. So the jars that I use, I know some of you have asked about these that have been in the videos about our storage, are these jars here. And they are 500 ml jars that have come from a company called Jars and Bottles. They've got a website, jarsandbottles.co.uk. I'm not affiliated in any way to the company. I'm just giving you that recommendation because these have worked really, really well for me. So these are what are termed lug lid jars. And I know that is quite controversial in the canning world. Um, the, I am not following um, USDA standards here. I don't really want to go into all the discussions of that. I just want to show some of our followers who have asked those questions about how I preserve um, and can for, to feed our family. So these jars have these sort of lug lids, which is also in the UK called a screw lid. It is a bit like a large jam jar, essentially. So one of the first things that we are going to have to do is we are going to have to prepare these jars ready for filling with the curry sauce that we have just prepared. So the curry sauce is here. Obviously, at this time period, it will be cooling, cooling down when I'm doing this. That's not a problem because I can just reheat that. This is what is called a hot pack method, which essentially means that the food that you're putting into the jar is hot and you're going to put it into the pressure canner with hot liquid at the bottom. You can use what is called a cold pack method, which is again what it sounds like. So the food is cold and then you put cold water in the bottom. I predominantly use a hot pack method because a lot of the things that I have been cooking will already be hot and I tend to process them straight away. So that's just what works for me. So the first thing we will need to do is we will need to sterilise these lids completely. You don't actually have to sterilise the jars because the pressure canning process will sterilise that. I'm not really sure on the science of that, why you have to sterilise the lids, but not the jars, because in my scientific background, I'm thinking that if that's sterilised, then that pretty much will get sterilised. But I'm trying to follow the instructions as close as I can with the um, products that are accessible in the UK. So I will sterilise these, it only takes five minutes, so it's not a problem. So we store these in our garage, as you've seen with our, with our products. So I put them through the dishwasher and then they put them in the garage. So when I get them out, I just um, make sure there's no remaining labels, which sometimes are still on from the dishwasher. That's why they're wet. It's not because I've tried to wash or sterilize these jars. I've just had to get some of the labels off them. So the lids will go into the water and they will be boiled for five minutes. And that's the sterilizing process for this. And these will just be used with the um, curry sauce to be packed into or just poured into. You should leave a gap at the top of your jars to allow the um, pressure to form appropriately. I found that these jars have just got a really nice line there. You should be leaving about an inch top at the top of your products. And I find that line is actually really pretty close to a good inch. So I find that really helpful for filling actually. So rather than using, you can get gadgets where you put them in and you see whether it's an inch depth. I just tend to fill to that line. I found that the most easy way to do it really. So we're nearly ready to start filling up the jars, the cans to put in the pressure canner. But I thought I would say a couple of extra things about this canner. So I know I said that I imported this canner and it's a Presto canner. It is called the Presto 23 Quartz Canner. Um, and the 23 quart canner actually fits in 16 of these 500 mil size jars. Essentially, you're going to have a layer on the bottom. You can get some dividers, so you'll have um, eight on that layer. Then you'll have eight on that layer as well. I tend to make um, stuff that I'm going to put in the canner in this preserving pan, just because this is the biggest pan that I've got. This does not have enough volume to fill the um, 16 cans, but I do like to run the pressure canner full. 
for a couple of reasons. If you don't fill it up, it's going to take longer to come to pressure and it's going to use more energy. And if you are using all that energy, getting your pressure canner full, you might as well put something else in there as well. So I will show you what I do um, when we start filling up these to try and make sure that I fill the pressure canner with as many cans as possible when I'm running a, a full batch. So let's now talk about how we actually fill the cans or jars. So these are our cleaned jars. Like I said, the jars themselves haven't actually been sterilised. I did boil this for five minutes to ensure that this was sterilised. I boiled it with the lids. So the lids have been boiled for five minutes to sterilise them. And also this ladle and um, this implement I'm going to use to try and pick up the lids. If you are using a two-piece lid, a more traditional American style two-piece lid, um, you can actually get like a little magnetic um, sort of rod really that picks up the metal lids. But obviously if you're using these lids, that's a little bit more difficult. So I found that as long as I use a sterilised implement, I don't see really any problems with that. So that's what they are for. So what we are going to do is we are going to fill them. You should leave about an inch of headspace. So I'm going to use this line here to fill to. A lot of the canning purists are going to say that what you should do is warm your jars up because obviously you're putting quite hot liquid into um, cold jars. Potentially you could crack a jar. These are strong jars and I've never ever had that problem so I don't bother with that but I think if you read a lot of the canning books they will tell you to do that as a precaution. So essentially all we are going to do is ladle. If you can see the sort of texture of this you shouldn't really, um, I'm going to mix this up nicely, be pressure canning very thick soup-like structures because this really affects how easy it is for the heat to pass through the substance that's in the jars. So this sort of texture here, for me, is the sort of maximum thickness that I would personally feel safe with processing. A lot of when people make soups in canning, they um, tend to say that what you should do is put your soup stuff in there with bits and then um, puree it afterwards if you want a thicker soup. So this is probably the, about the maximum. So what I would do is we just ladle this in. If you can try and be as clean as you can be when you're filling them, because what you really don't want is any of your food getting on the tops of the lids because that might affect the seal. We are going to clean them to try and avoid that. But that's why I always use one of these funnels to make sure that is pretty unlikely to happen. So as you can see, I go up to that line and then I would fill the rest of them. I'm just going to show you how I put the lids on um, and then I'll just get um, get these all done and we can show you the next step. So, it's sort of best practice to wipe the rim, just in case there was any food on there. And what you should use is vinegar. So in the UK, the most common type of vinegar we have is this sort of stuff, malt vinegar. I use this, it's a strong vinegar. It's at least five or 6% that, so it's absolutely fine. So all I do is just wipe that bit there where the seal will form. Obviously look, there's completely nothing on there because I used the funnel to keep that nice and clean. I'm then gonna take one of my lids and place it on. One of the important differences um, when looking at using the lug lids rather than the two part lids is if you read instructions when you're using the two part lids, they say that you should put your, um, when you put the ring on, it should be finger tight. So that means it's not sort of really screwed on tight, but with the lug lids, you do need to screw them on quite tight. So in order to do this, I just take a really clean tea towel because remember this is hot. That's why I'm using the, the tea towel. And then what you would do is I just hold the jar and give it a really good pull round to make sure that that lid is on. Obviously, you can tell at this point here, if you give that a good tap, that that is not sealed. It's just screwed shut. 
and we can show you the difference when they've been through the canna and they've cooled down that we will have that proper sealed seal formed. So I'll just fill the rest of these up and we'll show you the next step. So as you can see, I have filled the jars. Like I said, I like to process the pressure can of full. And whenever I use that jam pan, there's never quite enough really to fill the full 16 jars. So what I tend to do is this is how I can the all the different types of dried beans that we do. So every time I've got extra jars to fill the pressure canner, I might do three, four, five cans of beans each time. So I'm not canning beans as a separate process. It's just on that energy efficiency. And as you can see in these jars, we've got the beans at the bottom. These are our dried Bellotti beans, these ones that we grew at the allotment. I, there's 100 grams that I just literally measure out, pour in the jar, and then I add just boiling water to that same one inch, the line on those cans and just screw the lid on. And I'll process these. The reason that I can do this is because the beans with this sort of um, raw pack method require processing for 75 minutes at 10 PSI. Because I'm going to do the other um, curry base at the same pressure means I can do them at the same time. Because of the contents of this, in theory, you could press, you could process for a lower amount of time. However, because I've made it into a bit like a soup, so essentially it's a thicker liquid, I want to process for a much higher amount of time. And I tend to do this for 75 minutes at 10 PSI. Obviously the pressure does depend on your altitude, but throughout the UK, you can process up 10 PSI. But if you're elsewhere, you might need to look at what is the appropriate pressure for your altitude. Um, in terms of doing that, we're now going to have to put the cans into the pressure canner. Before I do that, I want to just point out a few things on the pressure canner. So we have a look. In the bottom of the pressure canner, there is this metal plate. That is to keep the cans off the direct heat of the bottom of the pan. So it's really important that you do use one of those. You can also see, I'm, I'm not sure how well this should show on the camera, but there are little lines in the pressure canner. That is telling you how much water to put in. So for a pressure canner, and there is one actually, it's right down here, you can feel it's a tiny dint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill that up to that level with boiling water before I start adding the cans. So I've filled up to that line with the boiling water. I'm gonna take these hot cans and I'm gonna put them into the canner. Make sure, like I said, you've got that bottom metal plate in, that's really important. So what I tend to do then is just get these cans and just check they're definitely tight. And I'll place eight in the bottom. And once I put the eight in, I'm going to put this extra divider on so I can put another eight in top, on top. So all the cans are loaded in now. I don't know if any of you that were particularly eagle-eyed, but I've noticed that I said it, it fits 16 cans and I somehow managed to have filled 18 cans. So those two cans here, I will let cool down, stick them in the fridge and we will use them over the next week. So that's fine, so we'll use them for a meal. So essentially now we have got the pressure canner in on, we're using a gas stove. You need to put the lid on. For this um, make of pressure canner, there is a marker there, a V, to line up how you put the lid on and then you sort of pull it round. So essentially, I'm gonna put it on and lock it in like that. That is very similar to a pressure cooker if you've used one of those in the UK. So now this is shut up. There are a number of stages to the canning process. So it's not an easy process. Well, it's easy to do, just quite time consuming. The first one we need to do is we need to bring the um, canner up to a temperature and allow all the air to escape from those jars because in that one inch top, there will be a large amount of air. We wanna force that air out so we can start creating the pressure. And in order to do that, what you need to do is you need to make sure you do not have any weights or anything on this section here. And there's also a secondary vent there. So what I would do is I turn it on to start off with as high as I can on the stove and the steam will start coming out of this bit here. 
as soon as the steam starts coming out of that bit there what we do i do is i turn the stove down so we can get it to the level of just a trickle of steam coming out and we have to leave that for 10 minutes for the purpose of this video i'm just going to turn this fan off just so you can hear me but please don't run your gas stove without the vent on for long periods of time because obviously that is quite unsafe so what I've done is turned the uh, amount of gas right up to high. In terms of getting the pressure, I tend to use this weight rather than relying on the gauge itself. And what that does now is as the pressure increases, this um, little weight is going to start to wobble to tell us that it's got to that 10 PSI. So you, you should see now that the gauge is starting to go up in pressure it will reach that 10 psi and as soon as we can hear that wobble sound of that um, weight we know that that's come up to pressure now i'm just going to put that fan back on now it might take a few minutes to come up to pressure so what we have done is we have um, put the weight on here and we have turned up the dial as you can hear, you need to get the pressure to the point that this weight starts to be wobbling a, sm a small amount. This is just about perfect. If you look at our dial, you can see that it's not reading at 10 psi. That could easily be for a number of reasons. It could be that the dial needs recalibrating um, and it's not matching up with the 10 pound weight. That is the main reason why I like to use the weight because if you're going to rely on the dial alone, you really need to get your pressure counter calibrated pretty regularly. The other thing is if you can hear that little tick, 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 I can hear that from the other room. So it means I don't need to sit in here making sure that pressure uh, stays at the right level. If you lose pressure at any time, you need to start the timings again. So it is a real pain. So you really want to make sure that you maintain that pressure at a nice steady level. So you need this to run for 75 minutes for our base curry sauce and the beans that are in there. Once that has completed the 75 minutes, I will turn the heat off and allow the pressure to fall naturally right down to zero before opening the top and taking out the hot contents. So I've let the pressure come down to zero. I know it looks like it's just tiny above zero on there, but that's just the way that the dial is reading. You can then take off the weight and you can notice there's no steam or anything coming out of there so that we know there is no pressure. We can then open the top. I would recommend to try and make you sure you open this away from yourself because there'll be a lot of steam in there. And then I use one of these to take the cans out. I think it is pretty important to use one of those and not try to take them out by other methods because as you'll see when I take them out the there is a lot of heat in these jars because of the pressure the jars are essentially superheated so even though the pressure has dropped the cans themselves can st still be extremely extremely hot. And there you go I have taken the jars out and you can still see there's a lot of boiling going on and that is because of the, the super heat that was really created by the pressure cannon. So at the moment, the lids do not look like they have been sucked down, but they will do that. And I leave them to cool naturally, usually overnight, because they tend to be canning in the evenings. And then we'll have a look at how we can check that those jars are sealed tomorrow. So it's now the next, well, it's the next evening actually. So we took these out last night, let them fully cool um, and they've been standing on the counter all day. It is important not to move your jars until they have completely cooled and settled once you take them out of the pressure canner. But for the last thing, I do want to show you the difference and how you can tell between a sort of fully sealed jar and one that hasn't completely sealed. Conveniently, because we have those two extra jars, when I was filling them, I did that ridiculous miscalculation. Clearly, I can't count. Um, then we've got some that have got products in, but have not got a full seal on them. So we can see the difference. Firstly, if Anthony comes in and has a look at the jars, I'm not sure how clear that will be on the video. But if you feel along here, I can feel that there is definitely a suction inwards. 
on the top of the jars. It's quite marked actually when you feel it. And the way that I personally check is you can take a flat knife and you can see that difference there if we come in actually. So you can see that there is a dip down where it's made a seal. If we have a look at um, another one, you can see that difference with that dip down, just to illustrate that. But a really simple way, and I got this tip off the Pre um, Preserving in Canning UK Facebook group, is once you've used these lug, lug jars, if I give them a good tap, if you listen in carefully, that sounds like quite a high pitched sound. Let's try another one. It's quite a high pitched sound. Now, if I grab this jar, which has got the same product in, but hasn't been through the canner, this has just been in the fridge, and give this one a tap. Because of all the air that is in that tox top section, it's resonating completely different through the jar. So let's try that again. This is not sealed. This has definitely got a good vacuum seal. Again. And if I check all these jars, and this not one. So you can really hear that's quite a distinct difference and it's a good way of checking that your jars have completely sealed. So hopefully that's given you a good tour of the canning processes that we use when using the lug, lug jars. So like I said, we do not fully follow the USDA standards, although we have actually, except from using the lug jars, everything else is following the actual standards pretty well. So um, we process these 75 minutes at 10 PSI in the pressure canner. I will keep these. I've kept our products that we pressure can for up to over two years now. They've been absolutely fine. In the main, they are eaten pretty quickly though, certainly within the one season. So if you've enjoyed the video today, please like, comment and subscribe. It only takes a minute, but it really helps our channel. Bye everyone.